Do you have any updates on the discussions around a hostage deal? Um, Netanyahu said he would send negotiators later this week to continue negotiations. Will Bill Burns be there? What can you tell us about where things stand? So I won't make any announcements with respect to the uh, leader of another agency. Follow my my typical practice here. Um, but uh, we continue to, to work on it. You heard the secretary speak to this in Aspen on Friday, where he said that, uh, in his estimation, we are inside the 10-yard line. But that, of course, doesn't mean that we'll ultimately be successful, but that if you look at how far we've come, we have significantly narrowed the disagreements between the parties and, and have a, a few remaining issues that need to be resolved. Now, since Friday, they're not yet resolved. We continue discussions with the, the other mediators uh, and with the governor of Israel to try to reach resolution, but we don't, uh, we don't have that yet, and I don't have any kind of forecast about when we might come to. So you don't anticipate this could be done by the time the Israeli prime minister addresses Congress on Wednesday? Um, uh, I'm not going to put, I thought you were going to say uh, when he arrives, and I was looking at the clock because I think yeah, he no. arrives pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> soon, like in the next few, hour, in the next few hours. Um, uh, I don't want to put any kind of, uh, uh, of timetable on it at all. And uh, it's it's just, it only because it's just very difficult to to predict. Will Blinken have any engagements with Netanyahu while he's here? Um, I would expect that he would attend the meeting with the president, but um, uh, uh, that meeting has not yet been been formally announced. So. And will he meet with the hostage families who are in town? Uh, will the the, the secretary? secretary yeah. I don't have any meetings to announce today, but as you know, he has met a number of times with the the, the families of hostages, both on our trips to Israel uh, and here at home. And he's met with them ten times, more than ten times. Um, so it has been a consistent priority of his to meet with hostage families and let them know all that we're trying to do to bring their relatives home. But I don't have any announcements to make about meetings this week. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Uh, with the Houthi attack on Tel Aviv on Friday, um, our video verification team did some did what they do best, and they they determined that the um, UAV. Uh, exploded about 200 meters away from the U.S. Embassy branch in Tel Aviv. Um, has there been any uh, discussion with the Israelis or any conclusion as to whether the U.S. Embassy branch was indeed a target? Of uh, we do not know at this time, at least, uh, uh, what the actual target was, which is not to say we have any information to suggest that uh, our embassy branch was the target. We just don't have any actual information about what, what the exact target was. Um, the Israelis, I think, as they've publicly announced, have, have said they identified the drone as being an Iranian drone launched from uh, Yemen. The Houthis, of course, claimed responsibility for it. We are in close contact with the Israelis as they fully investigate the source of the explosion and its intended target, but don't yet have any definitive uh, information about that second question. And given the proximity, do you expect, or has there been any change in security posture at that branch or any of the others? Uh, there, there hasn't been. As you are, I, I think, are probably aware, um, since October 7th, there have been a number of, of, of attacks on Israel writ large and on Tel Aviv. There was a, a while when uh, Tel Aviv was coming under daily attack from rockets from Gaza. Um, and we, since that time, have been very, always very closely monitoring uh, the security situation. We have well-established uh, well protocols uh, at our embassy and our embassy branch office for dealing with threats. Um, we uh, you know, conducted uh, an account accountability after the drone attack uh, on Thursday, I guess it was Friday morning there, and um, established full accountability for all of our personnel and our embassy and the embassy branch office are operating as normal today. Yeah, so I Thank you. Uh, just to be clear, uh, you're not expecting the Israeli Prime Minister to come to this building for any meeting, are you? No. You don't? No. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let me ask you this about the Prime Minister, uh, you know, as an expert, not, you know, not that I want you to get into it yet. But, what uh, am I an expert in? No, you are an expert on this issue, or an expert uh, in knowing the, the Israeli Prime Minister for sure. You've encountered him many times. But my question to you, would he be less inclined to be cooperative on this deal? You know, I mean, he's often by nature, but now he may feel that there's, you know, a great deal of disincentive to go ahead with this deal since the, 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 the person who basically, uh, you know, uh, articulated this deal uh, had decided that, that he will no longer be, run for office. Um, what? So, yeah. so expert or not, I try not to put myself uh, right. in right. the minds of anyone else, try right. to, to make assessments about uh, people based on their actions, and I will right. speak to the actions of the government of Israel, including right. the prime minister, mm -hmm. when it comes to this potential ceasefire deal, and that is that they have 
continue to stand by the proposal that the president outlined publicly some six weeks or so ago. Uh, we have been engaged with them over the course of the past few weeks trying to bridge the final differences. And what they tell us and what they continue to show is that they are working to try to get a deal. It doesn't mean that they are willing to agree to every demand mm -hmm. that Hamas has made. Of course not. That's the, the right. standard uh, way a negotiation proceeds. But we continue to judge that they are working to try to reach a deal. Okay, so you, you don't feel that uh, a great deal may have changed in, let's say, in what Israel would want or would agree to in, in the last 24 hours as a result? Uh, no, I do not. And again, I'm going to assess all the parties by the actions they take. Right. Yeah, a couple more questions. Um, the U.S. Uh, criticized the ruling, uh, the ICJ ruling, uh, that uh, uh, the Israeli occupation of Palestine is illegal. Why would you do that? Because you, you guys, I mean, just um, want to learn. Uh, you are a signatory to 242, 338, and so on, would speak very clearly on, you know, what is occupied yeah. territory and so on. Why would you be opposed to a statement that is stating the obvious, actually, so, uh, that the West Bank and East Jerusalem? So if you look out, the, if you look out the, if you look closely at the response that we gave to people that asked uh, for our yeah. take on this ruling on right. Friday, what we said is that we have been clear that the Israeli government's support for settlements is inconsistent with international law and of course runs contrary to the cause of peace um, and that we respect the role the international court of justice plays uh, in the peaceful settlement of disputes but what we are concerned about mm -hmm. is that parties will use the court's uh, advice as a pretext for further unilateral actions mm -hmm. that will just deepen divisions and make the cause of establishing an independent Palestinian, Palestinian state more difficult to achieve. So we're clear on what we think about the settlement program, and we're also clear about what we think the ultimate outcome ought to be here, which is the establishment of an independent Palestinian state, and that's what we continue to pursue. Right. I mean, your, your position is very clear on the occupation, very clear on the pursuit of a two-state solution and so on, and the settlement, all this. but. The Israelis are not responding. Now, you continue to say that the, the best or the most you know, feasible path forward on this is negotiation. But then we have the, you know, the legislative body of Israel come out and say, you know, we're not going to negotiate on this issue. So why not then you know, take this matter into some sort of an international forum? Uh, because we believe the best outcome ultimately to establish an independent Palestinian state. And, that, and it's important to remember the practical goal that we want to see achieved. Um, not votes at international bodies that don't do anything, not rhetorical statements that don't do anything. We want to see the actual establishment of an independent Palestinian state. And in our judgment, to get there, it is going to require a negotiation. And yeah, it's a very difficult process. Obviously, right. there's a reason why um, this dispute has been dragging on for decades now. But we continue to push for the establishment of a Palestinian state, and we continue to look at, at um, ways to come out of the current conflict um, and get a ceasefire and build a ceasefire into lasting peace and build a ceasefire into uh, enduring stability and ultimately push for the establishment of a Palestinian state. Not to say that it's easy. Of course, it's not easy, but in our judgment, that is the, uh, uh, the route that has the ultimate best chance of success. Mm -hmm. Lastly, uh, on the, the water, Israel is using water as a weapon, according to different uh, reports uh, in Gaza. I mean, it's like water has been cut off by 94 percent. Are you aware of the situation? Uh, I haven't seen that specific report, but I can tell you that we have been working to try and get food and, of course, water no. into mm -hmm. uh, the people of Gaza. We have been working to try and get pipelines turned back on. There have been times that Israel has made progress working with local Palestinian uh, agencies to try to get water turned back on. And then you had um, uh, events that led to pipes being disrupted again. Obviously, the provision of water is incredibly important. It's why, for another example, we've worked to get fuel into Gaza to um, uh, to allow desalinization plants to run so they can provide water to uh, the people who need it, and that continues to be a priority for us. Thank you. Yeah. Let's come back to the ICJ. So, so in your, your response to that, um, you're talking about you, what you don't want parties to use the, this opinion uh, as a pretext for further uni unilateral actions. What, what, what are we really talking about there? What, what, is, what is it that you're concerned that a court's decision will will be used as a pretext. For. So I don't want to prescribe any from here, um, but just as we have criticized unilateral actions that Israel has taken, uh, because we don't find them conducive to the goal of um, uh, reaching peace, we would see actions by other parties. So you've seen us, for example, when other countries have come out and recognized uh, a Palestinian state. 
uh, as a unilateral action. It's, of course, the right of any country to make that decision, but we see that ultimately as harmful to the ultimate goal of negotiating the establishment of a Palestinian state. So without prescribing any, uh, any exact options that various parties may take, it's that kind of unilateral thing that outside the context of negotiations, we just ultimately don't find helpful. Right. I think like what, what, what Said was, was kind of getting at, um, if you, you're, you're, you're basically saying we don't, we don't, we don't sort of see this, this court's opinion as useful. But that's not really what courts are for, right? They're not. So they're not there as bodies to make useful political interventions in issues. This is an issue where you say you support international law, but in an international law, the the concept of international law means that there is there are courts that can rule on these kind of things, right? And and now we've got the ICC and the ICJ have both uh, taken actions regarding Israel in, in in the last few months, and in both cases you've sort of pretty strongly uh, spoken out about about the courts, those courts um, interventions. So, you know, how, how can you say that you support international law when whenever the, the bodies of international so, law act, you, so, you, you denounce it? So um, various parties or observers to international fora or courts here can both respect a court system and disagree with rulings that courts make. You see that all the time, just thinking about domestically here at home, where an administration uh, can respect the work that the courts do, but disagree with an individual that ruling, ruling that comes down, um, be concerned about the practical implications of a decision that a court makes, plan to an appeal. They're all, it, it is, I think, keeping in practice with the way people respond to court decisions all around the world. And it's the case here where we can uh, respect the role that the courts play, but also be concerned with the implications of decisions that they make. And when we have those concerns, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to give voice to them. And, and but by doing that, you're kind of, you're signaling to your ally Israel that it, it doesn't need to follow those rulings. And so this was an advisory ruling, first of all. Um, but uh, I think what it signals is that when we have concerns, we're gonna speak to them publicly.